So in this lesson, we will continue on our path to proving Seeloff's first theorem. The next step is to prove the class equation. So the class equation is essentially a just a result of the fact that conjugacy classes partition a, a finite group G. So the class equation says that for any finite group G, the order of G equals the order of the center of G plus the following sum, the sum of over i going from one to r of the following indices. So the index of the centralizer of a i in g where the AIs are representatives of each conjugacy class of G that contains more than one element. So again, the sum runs over a set of representatives AI from each conjugacy class of G with more than one element. So recall that if an element is in the center of a group, then its conjugacy class will have exactly one element in it, that element itself. And so again, this class equation comes from the partitioning of the elements of G into conjugacy classes. So let's prove this class equation. So as we noted before, the set containing A is a conjugacy class with only one element. If and only if, a is in the center of G. So let's let the center of G be the set containing the identity and the following elements. Let's call it Z2, G3, all the way up to ZM. So there's exactly M elements in the center of G. And then let's look at the conjugacy classes that have more than one element. So let's let the conjugacy class of A1, the conjugacy class of A2, all the way up to the conjugacy class of say AR let's let these be the distinct conjugacy classes of G
that are not contained in the center of G. And the full set of Kondersky classes of G is given by a set containing the identity. A set containing Z2 all the way up to the set containing ZM and then a conjugate class of A1, a conjugate class of A2, up to the conjugate class of AR. And since these partition G, we have that the order of G would be equal to the order of the first M of these conjugate classes all have order one. So this would be the sum I equals one to M of one plus the sum of I going from one to R of the order of the conjugate class of AI. And we see that the first sum, the sum of one from one to M, just equals the order of the center. So there's exactly M elements in the center. And then by our previous lemma, we know that the order of the conjugate class of AI is equal to the index of the centralizer of AI. So we get that this second sum is equal to the sum where I ranges from one to R of the index of the centralizer of AI in G. And again, this falls from lemma one, which we proved earlier. So this gives the class equation. Again, this is just a, a consequence of the fact that the conjugate classes of G partition the group G. Next, we'll prove lemma two, which will be used in our proof of Silo's first theorem. Let N be a normal subgroup of G, then we can form the factor group of G over N. And it turns out that every subgroup of this factor group of G over N has the form of H mod N, where H is a subgroup of G. Okay, again, this proof, this lemma will be used in the proof of CLS first theorem. So for the proof of the lemma, let's let H bar be a subgroup of the factor group G over N. 
and let's we're going to use the natural projection homomorphism pi. So let's let pi from g to the factor of g over n be the natural projection homomorphism. which if you recall is defined by pi of an element g just equals the left coset gn. Now we have the fact that h bar is a subgroup of g mod n. Then the pre-image inverse of h bar which is the set of elements in G that get mapped to h bar so this is actually a subgroup of G so we have a homomorphism then the pre-image of a subgroup in the codomain is a subgroup of the domain. So the pre-image of H bar is a subgroup of G. So let's call this subgroup H. So I'm gonna let H be equal to the pre-image of H bar, which again is a subgroup of G. Then let's look at the set of left cosets H over N. So this is the set of all left cosets H, N, where H is in this subgroup H. Well, by definition of pi, this is just pi of the group H. And recall that H is the pre-image of H bar. So this is pi of the pre-image of H bar and pi of the pi inverse of H bar will just equal H bar. And so we've just shown that H bar is equal to the set of left cosets H over N. So this gives our last piece of the puzzle that we need before we prove Seeler's first theorem. So now let's restate and prove Seeler's first theorem. Let P be a prime and let G be a finite group. If P to the power K divides the order of G then G has a subgroup of order P to the K. So the proof is a proof by induction on the order of G. So for the basis step, 
if the order of G is equal to one, then the theorem is trivially true. So the basis step is established. So now we're going to assume that the statement is true for all groups of order less than the order of G. So from this assumption, we're going to show that the result holds for the group G as well. Now, we're going to first suppose that H is a proper subgroup of G and that p to the power k divides the order of this proper subgroup h. So h is a proper subgroup, that means that h is a subgroup that is not equal to the group g itself. So suppose we have a proper subgroup of g and p to the power k divides this subgroup h. Well, since h has order less than the order of g, we can use our inductive hypothesis so we can assume that H has a subgroup let's call it T of order P to the K well, since T is a subgroup of H and H is a subgroup of G, then T is also a subgroup of G. And since T has order P to the K, we are done. So in this particular case, when we have a proper subgroup H of G and P to the K divides the subgroup H, then we've proved that the theorem holds. So for the rest of the proof, we're going to assume that P to the K does not divide the order of any proper subgroup. So therefore, we now assume that P to the K does not divide the order of any proper subgroup of G. Now we're going to use the class equation so we have the order of G equals the order of the center of G plus the sum of the following indices where the 
these AIs are representatives of the conjugacy classes of G that are not contained in the center. So the order the sum runs over a set of representatives. each conjugacy class where the representatives AI are not in the center of G. So we're assuming that P to the K divides the order of the group G so since P to the K divides the order of G but I can write the order of G as the index of the centralizer of any one of the AIs times the order of the centralizer of AI. And the point is that P to the K divides the order of G, but recall that we're assuming that P to the K does not divide the order of any proper subgroup. So P to the K cannot divide the order of the centralizer of AI. So we can conclude at least one factor of P must divide the index of the centralizer of AI. For all AI not in the center of G. This follows again because the centralizer of AI is a proper subgroup and P to the K cannot divide the centralizer of AI. That must mean that at least one factor of P divides the, the index of the centralizer in G. So now we rewrite the class equation and we see that P must divide the order of G minus the sum one I going from one to R of the indices of the centralizers. Since P divides each one of these indices and P divides the order of the group, P divides this, this whole expression. But this whole expression just equals the order of the center of G. So we've just shown that P must divide the order of the center of G. I'm going to actually call on the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, which states that every finite abelian group is isomorphic to a direct product of cyclic groups whose orders are prime powers. And so since the center of G is an abelian group in its own right, it's a finite abelian group because G is finite, and we know that P divides the order of the center of G it must be true that the center contains an element with order P. The center must be isomorphic to a cyclic group with a prime power order, then we can find an element 
let's call it x, with prime order p. So since p divides the order of the center of g by the fundamental theorem, of finite billion groups, the center of G contains an element let's call it X with order P And since X is in the center of G, the cyclic subgroup generated by X is a normal subgroup of G. And since we have a normal subgroup of G, we can form the factor group of G mod the cyclic subgroup generated by X. Now, P to the K divides the order of G and the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by X is equal to P we see that P to the K minus 1 must divide the order of G mod the cyclic subgroup generated by X. And the, the group G mod cyclic subgroup generated by X is less than the order of G. And so by our inductive hypothesis, this group has a subgroup of order p to the k minus 1. So by our inductive hypothesis, this factor group, which has order less than the order of g, has a subgroup Let's call it H bar of order P to the K minus one. Now lemma two comes into play. So by lemma two, we have a subgroup of this factor group. We can assume now that H bar has the form H mod the cyclic subgroup generated by X for some subgroup H of G So then P to the K minus one, which equals the order of H bar, that equals the order of the factor group H over cyclic subgroup generated by X. And since these are finite groups, this is equal to the order of H divided by the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by 
x, and this equals the order of age divided by p. So this equation implies that the order of h equals p to the k. And h is a subgroup of g. So we've just produced a subgroup of G of or P to the K. This contradicts our assumption that no such subgroup exists. So our assumption was, if you recall, that, that, that P to the K does not divide the order of any proper subgroup of G. And this assumption led to a contradiction so it must be the case that we originally had a subgroup whose order is divisible by p to the k, and then we can apply the inductive hypothesis to that subgroup, and we, that finishes the proof of Seeloff's theorem. So therefore, and like in the first case, we must have originally had a subgroup of G whose order is divisible by P to the K And we showed how we can apply the inductive hypothesis to produce the required subgroup. That finishes the proof of Seeloff's first theorem. So again, if we go back to the statement, we see that if a prime power divides the order of a group G, where G is a finite group, then G has a subgroup of order equal to that prime power.